So this was a couple weeks ago, but I haven't seen an official statement on it. Um, a U.S. citizen who was residing in Ukraine has been arrested and that, um, you know, he was a California born man. He was in the past like a business insider contributor and he had a YouTube channel. He was an outspoken critic of Zelensky's regime. Um, the Ukrainian SBU released a press release saying he was arrested for justifying Putin's invasion. So um, ultimately it added up to speech. And uh, I spoke with Congressman Ted Lieu, Democrat, and he said he urges the State Department to engage its authorities to you know, work out some sort of negotiation to get him released. So are you guys aware of this? How do we feel about our allies you know, detaining U.S. citizens for speech abroad? Um, so w w I will say in general that we're aware of the report. Um, we obviously support the, the exercise of freedom of speech anywhere in the world, and I'll leave it at that. So you guys aren't working to, to get him released? I, I'm going to leave my comments uh, uh, where, I just, where I just left them. Kai. This is my video update from Nicosia, Cyprus on this Monday morning. Let's talk about some news. And how about that uh, exchange between the reporter and the U.S. State Department spokesman. How do we feel about our allies detaining U.S. citizens for free speech? How do we feel about our allies detaining U.S. citizens for free speech abroad, for free speech abroad? The, uh, the State Department spokesman, I believe his name is Matthew, Matthew Miller, I think is his name. He didn't have a comment. He could not comment to, uh, to that question posed to him by that journalist. No comment. It's a pretty simple answer, actually. How do you feel as the United States of America? How do you feel about, about allies like Ukraine? detaining U.S. citizens simply because they spoke out against the Alensky regime, against your allies' government. How do you feel about that? The answer is actually very simple. We are going to get Gonzalo released. The United States of America believes in free speech, First Amendment, all of that stuff, and we're going to work our hardest to make sure that our ally of which we pretty much control the entire government and fund the entire country, we're gonna make sure that our ally releases this US citizen. That's a pretty simple one to answer. I mean, you can tee that one up and, and hit it out of the park pretty, pretty easily there, but nope, the US State Department spokesman, he didn't wanna comment. Maybe, just maybe the US State Department just maybe the U.S. State Department is actually perfectly comfortable with having Gonzalo not, uh, not free and speaking, speaking out about the corrupt Alensky regime. Maybe, just maybe they're perfectly fine with Gonzalo being right where he is at the moment and not able to speak freely. Just... Just a hunch. Anyway, good on that reporter for, uh, for bringing this up to the U.S. State Department. And remember what I said in a video a couple of days ago, that if you are a U.S. citizen, then you, uh, you can get in touch with your state representative or your state senator, and they will have to. They will have to contact the State Department and uh, take this up with the State Department because this is, a, this is a U.S. citizen who is currently being detained for free speech. That is why he is being detained, because he spoke freely. So moving on from that video, let's talk about the Lindsey Graham video because, boy, is there a lot of uh, fallout from Lindsey Graham's video from Kiev the other day. Now, the Russian... I believe the Russian Ministry of the Interior, they're, they're putting Lindsey Graham on a list. <laughs> they are going after Lindsey Graham for what he said the other day, where he said uh, Russians are dying, and he used the word Russians. 
Russians are dying and it's the best money we've ever spent as the United States. It's the best money we've ever spent. Now, uh, Maria Zakharova, she came out with a comment uh, about this, Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin spokesman. He commented about this and the Russian Ministry of the Interior, they are putting Graham on a list. And it looks like Graham is scared. He is very, very scared. He's so scared about the latest developments, him being on, uh, on a list for, uh, in Russia for being wanted for these statements that he has, uh, he has run to Reuters to clarify what he said. And according to Lindsey Graham, he did not uh, say what that video says, he said. Lindsey Graham is uh, claiming that the video that Ukraine that Ukraine put out, remember in my video yesterday, I said that this exchange between Graham and Alensky was a Ukraine video that they edited, that they added music to, and that they promoted on social media. So the video that the Alensky regime created and put out on social media, according to Lindsey Graham and Reuters, was, uh, was creatively edited by the Alensky regime to give the impression that Lindsey Graham said, Russians are dying. It's the, best, uh, it's the best money we've ever spent. So Lindsey Graham is kind of, in a way, throwing the Alensky regime under the bus to save his own hide. And let me, let me read you what Reuters is reporting what Lindsey Graham has told Reuters to report. U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham disputed Russian criticism of his support for Ukraine on Sunday, saying he had simply praised the spirit of Ukrainians in resisting a Russian invasion with assistance provided by Washington. Now, the title of this Reuters article is Dismissing Russian Criticism, U.S. Senator Graham praises Ukrainian resistance. Graham said he was visiting on the 457th day of a war that Russia had assumed would be completed within three days. And Graham said Ukrainians resisting the invasion reminded him of our better selves in America. There was a time in America that we were this way, fighting to the last person. We were going to be free or die. Now you are free, Alensky responded in the encounter. And we will be, Graham, and we will be, Graham replied, and the Russians are dying. Alensky then added, yes, but they came to our territory. We are not fighting on their territory. Graham said he had mentioned to Alensky that Ukraine has adopted the American mantra, live free or die. It has been a good investment by the United States to help liberate Ukraine from Russian war criminals. So that is what Reuters is reporting, citing Lindsey Graham and Lindsey Graham's office. Now, Graham said he has a full transcript of the exchange that he had with Zelensky, but he hasn't released the full, the full transcript. I say release it so we can get some proper context as to what uh, Lindsey Graham said when he was speaking to Alensky, Russians are dying. He was happy that Russians are dying, not Russian military, but Russians. That he did say, of course, Graham is claiming that he said Russians are dying. That's one part of the conversation. And then later on, he said that it was the best investment that America had made. And basically he's claiming that the Alensky regime they, uh, they cut and pasted, Russians are dying, best investment we've, uh, we've made. They, uh, they pasted those, those words together to give the impression that Lindsey Graham said, Russians are dying, best investment we've, uh, we've made, best money we've spent. That's what Graham is claiming, that those two statements, which were made at, at separate times during the conversation, were cut and pasted together, edited together to to make it seem like it was like it was one sentence either way it doesn't look good for lindsey graham i mean whichever way he tries to explain this 
you know, he's trying to say this is this is all part of the American mantra of live free or die. So he's trying to appeal to to American patriotism, right? The founding fathers and the Revolutionary War and all that stuff. That's what he's trying to to appeal to. But either way, it, it, it's not looking good for Graham. Even if he said Russians are dying and he was happy when he said that, you can see he was smiling about that. And then later on in the conversation, he said, you know, supporting Ukraine or the live free or die mantra of Ukraine is, uh, is the best uh, money we've ever spent. Still doesn't look good. <laughs> it still doesn't look good at all for Graham. So he's trying to explain it away. He's saying that this was creative editing by Ukraine. Well, what does that tell you about the Alensky regime? Is Graham saying that the Alensky regime are a bunch of propagandists? Are they twisting Graham's words? <laughs> you know, it's, just keep digging, Lindsey Graham. Keep digging. He's scared. He got scared that the Russian... Uh, Interior Ministry put him on uh, on a type of of wanted list, like a type of list where where they're like, you know, we're gonna we're gonna come and get you, Graham, for that comment. So he got spooked. He definitely got spooked. All right. So that is the latest with uh, the Lindsey Graham video. Let's now talk about the big story for the day, and that is the elections in Turkey. The elections in Turkey. And to no one's surprise, Erdogan won the elections in Turkey with around 52, 53% of the vote. This was uh, fully expected. Uh, Erdogan, he gave a, a big speech in Ankara Right outside of the, uh, the presidential palace, he said, Western media lost. This is in front of about like 320,000 people, a huge, a huge gathering. He said, Western media has lost. 85 million Turkish citizens became the winners of these elections. That is what uh, Erdogan told his supporters. Uh, there's not going to be any type of protesting of the elections or the election count or anything like that. The, uh, the opposition candidate, he has conceded that he has lost and he said he's going to stay in opposition and fight Erdogan as the opposition candidate and the opposition parties because this is not one party. We're talking about six parties under one umbrella that went up against Erdogan. So the, uh, the results in Turkey, as I said, were expected. After the first round of voting, Erdogan just needed... 1% more to get over the 50% mark, and he got it. He got 3%, 3% more, and it pushed him over the, the, uh, the amount that he needed so that he could be reelected. The interesting part about this vote in Turkey, in my opinion, is that Erdogan, he campaigned on, on a platform of Turkish neutrality in the war in Ukraine. And uh, anti-Western anti sentiments, that's really what won him the election because the Turkish economy is not in a good state. Um, it's undergoing terrible inflation. And the conflict in Ukraine actually helped Erdogan's re-election because he, he campaigned on the platform that he's going to stay the course, which is that Turkey's not going to sanction Russia they're not going to take sides in this conflict. They're going to try to mediate a solution. And, uh, and he went against the Western, the Western media, Western, uh, Western culture, the neoliberal globalist type of culture that's, that the West promotes so much. All of these things is what pushed Erdogan over the 50% mark, which is interesting. That's, that's how he won. That's how he won this election, in my opinion. And uh, that's, that says a lot when you campaign against the West now, and that's what helps you win elections. I remember a time when uh, the candidates would campaign that they were pro-West, and that's what would help them win elections. Now it's, it's the reverse. Now Turkey, you know, Turkey and Erdogan, he has a complicated relationship with Putin and Russia. 
They've, uh, they've been on the opposite sides of many conflicts, including Syria and even Ukraine, while Turkey claims to be neutral. We know that uh, Turkey has provided and many people claim they still are providing weapons to the Aletsky regime, selling weapons to, to the Aletsky regime, stuff like the uh, Bayraktar drones. But Putin and Erdogan, while they have a complicated relationship, they've always found ways to communicate and to, and to work together and to work together. And that's, I guess that's the, the important part to, to all of this, which is that Erdogan, he skillfully finds a way to, to walk that, that line between NATO, the West and Russia and, and the East. So, that was the big story, the elections in Turkey. And since we're talking about countries moving east, we have the news that Saudi Arabia is in talks to join the BRICS Bank. Huge development. This is, this is the real big global conflict that is taking place on on an economic level, on a financial level. Saudi Arabia, the petrodollar, they're looking to join the BRICS Bank. That's huge. They're looking to join BRICS. That's huge. They're looking to join the SCO. Iran is moving towards BRICS, the SCO, the BRICS Bank. Huge uh, development there. And uh, as Lindsey Graham was in Kiev, because the United States is completely bogged down in Ukraine. Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, he made his fourth trip to Africa. So Lindsey Graham, he's made three trips in one year to Kiev. Lavrov has made four trips in one year to Africa. And right now he is in Nairobi, Kenya. Once again, meeting with African officials. And what are they talking about? Multipolarity. BRICS, the SCO, the BRICS Bank, One Belt, One Road, all of these things, that's what they're discussing right now in Africa, Lavrov and the leaders of, uh, of Kenya. So Graham is bogged down in the United States, they're bogged down in Ukraine and they're constantly visiting Alensky, giving him more money and more weapons. And uh, Russia and China they're traveling the rest of the world and they're making deals and they're building a multipolar system, multipolar architecture. And Saudi Arabia is about to join that multipolar architecture. So as the collective West is giving weapons to, uh, to Ukraine, the Russians are destroying those weapons on a daily basis. We had another big day of strikes all throughout Ukraine in just about every region and uh, city in Ukraine, from Kiev to Odessa, Lviv, Venetia, Kremenchuk, Poltava, and Khmelnytsky. Khmelnytsky, that is a hard one to say. Remember that city? That was the city where we had the huge warehouse explosion, where it is alleged that uh, the UK was... Well, the Ukraine, Ukraine government was storing UK's depleted uranium for the Challenger tanks. That's, that's what many people think caused that huge explosion in uh, Khmelnytsky. But the Russians hit that region again as well. And so the Russians are destroying all of the, uh, the weapons, warehouses and storage facilities that Ukraine is, is going to need for their big spring, winter, fall, fall, spring, winter, offensive. So every time the Russians launch these attacks, these drone attacks, these missile attacks across Ukraine, they destroy weapons, weapons facilities, and then Alensky runs around begging for more weapons and more money so he can buy some homes. <laughs> so this is, this is where we are at the moment. This is this is what's going on. The Russians destroy all the weapons, or most of the weapons, that the collective West sends to Ukraine. And why can the Russians do this? Because they control the air. 
because the air defense of, uh, of Ukraine over the last year was being degraded by the Russian missile strikes. So now they can send drones and glide bombs and missiles pretty much wherever they want in Ukraine to destroy the weapons uh, warehouses. So now, of course, the Ukraine officials, they say that yesterday's massive drone and missile strikes throughout, throughout Kiev resulted in a near 100% success rate of knocking out those missiles. 40 drones launched in uh, Ukraine and Ukraine air defense took out 42 of the, <laughs> the uh, drones, right? You have the, the Ukraine uh, math when it, comes to this, when it comes to the success rate of hitting the Russian drones and uh, missiles. So that is what is happening with regards to the big counteroffensive. Ukraine's going to have to continue to delay because the weapons continue to be destroyed. And Elensky, uh, I guess we're moving into, a, into clown world territory now. Elensky, he put a proposal to the parliament, to the Ukrainian parliament, to sanction Iran for 50 years. And the reason being that Iran is providing the drones that Russia is using to hit Ukraine territory. And so Alensky, he wants to sanction Iran for 50 years. No trade, no investment. Alensky even says that, uh, that Iranian transportation and trade cannot pass over Ukrainian territory either. So... I imagine that Iranian officials are very concerned about these, uh, these sanctions from Ukraine. 50 years on the sanctions list. That is Alensky's latest proposal to the Ukraine parliament. And since we're on clown world topics, have you seen the video of what is alleged to be Alensky? Actually, Alensky's wife, Alenska's villa in Crimea, which was recently seized by the Crimean authorities, by the Russian Federation. Now, I don't know. I'm going to put the video up right now so you can see it. I don't know if this entire structure is, uh, is the property that Alensky owns in Crimea or if he has a flat in this building. But whatever the case, wow, that is a pretty... That is a pretty nice, nice building in Crimea. And the, uh, the claims are that Alensky bought this, this apartment. His wife bought this apartment for like 160,000 euros, even though it was valued at something like 300 or 400,000 euros, something crazy like that. He got this, this property at a very, very cheap price, 50% below market value. And of course, this property was sold to Alensky because as he was becoming president of Ukraine, he would make up that 50% uh, market value difference by providing favors. I imagine providing favors to the, to the entity, the oligarch that gave him this villa or gave his wife this villa because it's under his wife's name. So an incredible property purchased at rock bottom prices by Alensky. Now it is in the hands of Crimean authorities and the Russian Federation. Alensky is not gonna be happy about that. He's a collector of homes. He absolutely hates it when his homes get confiscated. He's gonna be very, very upset about, let's walk that way, about this property seizure. What a property. What a beautiful property at that. So let's do a final clown world and we'll wrap up this video. And in this clown world, Vovan and Lexis, they strike again. And this time they prank called the current mayor of Athens. That's who they got this time around. Now they've, they've prank called mayors before. I think one time they prank called the mayor of, I want to say Madrid or Barcelona. I think Madrid. They prank, they prank called him like, I don't know, I think like six, 
six, seven months ago. Well, this time they got the, the mayor of Athens, the current mayor of Athens, who, Kostas Bakoyanis, who is the nephew of the prime minister of Greece, Kostas Mitsotakis. So Mitsotakis, his sister, that's her son. And Mitsotakis' sister, Dora Bakoyanis, at one point in time, she was mayor of Athens, I believe during the, the Olympics, when Athens got the Olympics back in 2000, gosh, when was it? 2004, I believe. Anyway, I'm terrible with dates. But uh, his mother, the mayor of Athens now, his mother was also the mayor of Athens. And his uncle is... See a little bit of of Cyprus here. What a typical Cyprus Nicosia neighborhood looks like. So his uh, his uncle is the prime minister, and goes and um, and Mitsotakis, the prime minister of Greece now. His father was once prime minister as well. So I think you can see the type of of political. Uh, royalty that uh, that we're dealing with here that is running uh, Greece. It really is a family business. Running Greece is a family business, as you can see. So uh, anyway, uh, Vauban and Lexis, they pretended to be the mayor of Warsaw, Poland, when they called the mayor of Athens. Now, why is this an interesting clown world? Well, it's an interesting clown world because... All of a sudden, it got really, really windy. Come on, wind. And I didn't put my, uh, my mic uh, wind guard because it wasn't windy. Now it's windy again. So um, it's, this is an interesting prank call because they got the mayor of Athens to admit, this is what he admitted, to who he thought was the mayor of Warsaw, he said that uh, Greece is on the right side of history. That was what he told the mayor of Warsaw. Greece is on the right side of history, even though uh, the Mitsotakis government, the Greek government at one point in time, when Alensky was talking to the different parliaments around Europe, like the first couple of months of the conflict, the Greek parliament actually allowed an Azov fighter to speak to the Greek parliament, which was just a disaster. A disaster to have an Azov guy speak to the Greek parliament. But anyway, we'll, uh, we'll not talk about that. The mayor of Athens actually believes that Greece is on the right side of history. Boy, are you mistaken there. And he admitted that Greece is trying to find a sneaky way to get S-300s to Ukraine via Poland. He actually said this. He said that, that the U.S. would be would be giving the, or at least the assumption is, that the U.S. would be giving Greece Patriot air defense, and Greece has to find a way without Russia's permission, because Russia has to give permission for the transfers of, S of S-300. So Greece has to find a way, a sneaky way, to get the S-300s to Ukraine. And he said that uh, this is usually done by uh, Poland. That's the route that the weapons take. They go through Poland and then through, through Ukraine. So he made the admission, even though Mitsotakis is on record saying Greece will not give up its S-300s, he says that Greece is trying to find a way to get the S-300s to Ukraine. Now, keep in mind, this is just the mayor of Athens, but he's also part of the family. So I imagine he, he hears things, <laughs> I, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how close he is to his uncle, but... It's quite an interesting statement. Of course, maybe he was just trying to impress the, uh, the mayor of Warsaw because we are dealing with Poland and Poland is, is super Russo, Russophobic. They absolutely hate Russia, the, the leadership of, uh, of the Polish uh, government. So maybe he was just trying to impress the mayor of Warsaw by saying that Greece is gonna find a way to get, to get S-300s to Ukraine. Anyway, he also said that uh, Greece is one of the main, uh, main hubs of weapon transfers to Ukraine. And it goes through the 
the North Greece port city of Alexandrupolis. So he also said that. He said a lot of the weapons, they travel through Greece and they either make their way to Ukraine or they make their way to Poland and then Ukraine. So he also said that in this prank call. Anyway, that is uh, Boban and Lexis once again. They, uh, they fool another collective West politician. That is the video, everybody, theduran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, and Rockfin. Go to the Duran shop. Use the code GOODDAY. 10% off all merch. I'm going to end the video there as we stroll through a very... Very typical Nicosia residential neighborhood. Take care.